He's uh, the running mate, uh, vice president running mate of Tom Hofwin here. They're running as abolitionists uh, for the for our great nation here. And so let's give one more round of applause for Mr. Andy Pryor. Thank you. One last thing. I think I have some flyers that have some financial uh, information on them <laughs> that, that has uh, connected with him. They're on the table there if you want to check them out. So, last night I kind of talked about some of the additional ways that an abolitionist can run for office, work in a variety of work areas, and, and impact the political realm more broadly, right? And we just heard an excellent, excellent breakdown of exactly the differences legislatively between a true abolitionist bill and a pro-life regulatory bill. Tonight I want to talk about how we go beyond the state level and we actually use the U.S. Constitution at a federal level to deal with the abolition of abortion. Because here's the reality. It is not either or. It is all of the above. We have to have people involved in the abolition of abortion in elected office at every single level of government. Your city council members, your county commissioners, your state legislators, your state governors and vice governors, your Congress people, your U.S. Senators, and most importantly, the President. As Tom said last night, the President has the most raw power of any politician in office. That's why he titled his talk the Doctrine of the Greater Magistrate. Someone who's got that kind of power must use it to protect the babies. It's not optional. We can't make it optional. So, let's think about this for a moment. And I'm glad Russell brought up the idea of states defying the government on a variety of other issues. Okay? Currently, the popular hot topic is, you know, whether or not it's legal to smoke weed, and whether the federal government's going to appreciate that or not. In the past, when the abolition of abortion was, or excuse me, the abolition of slavery was the issue of our day 170 years ago, there were states that were actively defying the federal government's involvement in trying to maintain slavery. Okay? And when I say the federal government's involvement, we had U.S. Marshals in states that were considered free states capturing escaped slaves and escorting back to the slave state they came from. And the local governments, if they were truly interposing, would do something to try to stop them, okay? But not always. Sometimes it took a mob. It took people acting on their own volition, right? Individuals stepping forward. But they were not doing so with the requirements of the oath of office that they had sworn because they'd been elected to a position of power. They were doing so because they believed it was morally wrong to enslave a fellow human being to capture that person who had managed to escape and send them back to slavery. Okay? So, let me give you all a quick thought experiment. And actually, it's not really an experiment, it's reality right now. As Russell pointed out, there are states that are currently right now defying the federal government on specific issues that they feel are important to the citizens of those states. Okay? But here's the thing. 
the federal government still arrests people, tries people, and incarcerates people in those states for breaking federal laws regarding recreational weed and other things. Why? Exactly what Tom was talking about last time. The greater magistrate is still imposing their beliefs top down. Okay? Last I checked, and I've got a couple of friends who have moved to Oklahoma to take advantage of the legal weed up there, okay? And they are completely in favor of that. But if they got arrested for violating federal law by a federal marshal, would the state of Oklahoma defend them in court? No. The state of Oklahoma is not going to defend them. So the state of Oklahoma is going to interpose to a degree. They're going to find the line that they're willing to go up to, and that's all they're going to do. Okay? When we look at the abolishment of abortion in this country, if we are only pursuing one strategy and not looking at it from an all above perspective, we end up in situations where the federal government and your local or your state government are going to be in conflict. And it's going to be very difficult to get that alignment right unless we are actively working abolition at every level. Okay? There have been a lot of people over the years, and Tom referenced it last night, I kind of talked about it myself last night, that don't think the president can do anything. Because, as we just mentioned, the Supreme Court has spoken from on high. Right? So all the president can possibly do is just nominate some court justices, and if he's lucky, he might get two or three or even four, praise God, in his time in office, and someday that's going to change the makeup of the court, and we might have some changes, okay? But as we talked about last night, the Constitution already defends the babies in the womb, period. Murder is not in the Constitution. You do not have the right to murder somebody in the Constitution. Every state, all 50 states have a current murder code. If you kill somebody, they will arrest you if they figure out that you're the one who did it. They will prosecute you. There is not a single state that has said, ah, you can kill somebody and get away with it. We're just not going to prosecute you. In fact, we would find that to be abhorrent we would find that to be ungodly, unchristian, unconstitutional. So at the federal level, Congress doesn't have to pass any laws to make abortion illegal. It's already illegal under the Constitution. The president doesn't have to do anything other than say, Abortion is unconstitutional, and we are going to treat it as such. He doesn't have to listen to the Supreme Court that says whatever they want to say. Because they are outside the bounds of the Constitution when they say those things. That is truly defying an unconstitutional, immoral action that has been made by a certain branch of government. Now, in our Founders' wisdom, in the original writing of the Constitution, and if we include the Bill of Rights, it was still in there too, the states had a say in how the federal government operated. You say, well, how is that possible? The states selected the U.S. Senators. 
Okay? It was not popular vote like we have currently. It was a selection by the states. And the states had that role so that they could influence the federal government in ways that would protect the people of their states. And if you remember, the U.S. Senate, each state got the same number of senators, two. So every state was on an even playing field, regardless of their population, size, anything. Okay? That was very powerful for the states. They had the ability then to tell the president, we don't like this treaty that you have made with this other foreign country. We're going to vote down this treaty. They can tell the president, we don't like this court nominee that you have submitted to us. We're going to vote down this nominee to the Supreme Court. They could even tell the House of Representatives who held this purse strings, we don't like this spending bill because we can't afford it as a country and vote it down. The states had tremendous power within the federal government as long as they selected U.S. senators. Think about it for a second. The 17th Amendment, which changed U.S. senators' selection to direct election and made it a popular vote of we the people, eliminated the states from their role under the Constitution in the federal government. Completely wiped them out. So now the federal government has absolutely no incentive whatsoever to listen to state governments when the states are trying to interpose on what the government is doing. Now I'm not saying the states have no role, but I am saying that they don't have their original role. They don't have the same power anymore. Okay? And so what we end up with is a federal government that is missing part of its checks and balances. We have a Supreme Court that everyone looks to and says they are on high and they are dictating to all of us what we can and can't do. And essentially we have, as I think Tom actually used these words last night, we had a coup d'etat against our former government where now nine unelected, unaccountable justices are dictating what the rest of us should and shouldn't do from a governmental perspective, okay? Think about it. Which House of Congress, representatives or the senators, votes in an impeachment process? The senators sit in justice. They're the ones who vote impeachment. So if we want impeachment of our justices for failing to follow the Constitution, it's up to the U.S. Senate to vote that they are indeed needing to be impeached. They're the conviction side, excuse me. The House is the one who sets up the, the process, but the senators are the ones who actually convict them and say, you're out. You're not following the Constitution. You do not have this office in the Supreme Court, for life, it is for good behavior and constitutional behavior. So again, the states have lost some of their power and influence within the federal government. And so at this point in time, quite honestly, at the federal government level, there really is only one avenue at the federal government level that will involve abolition of abortion. And that's having an abolitionist president stepping in and saying, we're following the Constitution, babies are people, they are human beings made in the image of God, and this is how we're going to proceed forward. We are ignoring the Supreme Court, and Congress, sorry, you don't have a role either because there's no legislation that needs to be passed. We're just going to follow the Constitution. It's simple. That's all we're going to do. But here's where the states do have the big role. And this is where the interposition needs to happen. Okay? Because if the president says that of his own volition, we elect someone like Tom, 
who is the only presidential candidate to have ever said this, regardless of political party, regardless of anything, he cannot do it without the support of additional members of government all the way down the line. He needs those governors and those legislators to step forward and say, yes, we're in agreement with this. We are in agreement with the Constitution. We want to protect the babies, and we are going to do what is constitutional, what is right, what is righteous. And that's why I say we've got to do it all of the above. We have to elect governors. We have to elect legislators who will do this. We can't just assume that it's all going to get fixed if we do this one thing or if we do that one thing. It's an all of the above. Now, Tom mentioned this last night. There are examples in our country's history when a state was doing wrong, the federal government in the form of the president, because he is the executive, he is the one that wields the sword of power at the federal level, stepped in to right those wrongs. Okay? So, yes, it is his job to step in and address the states, because, let's be honest, if we had someone like Tom in the White House, and if he did exactly what he has said he was going to do, which was to find that the babies are protected under the Constitution and that we need to proceed that way, there are going to be states who are going to stand up and say, not in our state. We're going to continue to let all the babies get murdered in our state. I believe that there will be a few states that would step forward and say, you're right, and we're going to join you. I pray, pray that Oklahoma, Texas, and a few others would do that. But we know for a fact there are going to be states who are going to step out and say, no, nope, we don't join you. We are going to still allow the babies to be murdered in our state, period, because we have the right to do that. Now, for a number of years now, there has been this really divisive attitude in our country. And I see people on social media regularly predicting that, oh, this next election is so divisive. We're going to see civil war and violence in the streets and this and that. And that's a possibility. I don't want to deny it. Okay? And our country has seen that kind of division before. It would not be the first time. But that is where the greater magistrate steps in and says, no. This is the righteous way. This is the righteous path. This is what we're going to do to maintain domestic tranquility, protect and establish justice for everyone. And that is a righteous thing to do for the greater magistrate. In fact, biblically, it is the only option for the greater magistrate. Because if he does it elsewise, he is outside of his biblical calling for his office as a greater magistrate. So the example last night that was mentioned where Eisenhower sent the 101st Airborne to escort those children into a high school in Arkansas because the governor was using a mob and his local National Guard to prevent them. That's an example of where the president is stepping in and saying, you're wrong. You're wrong. You are not doing this from a righteous perspective. This is unjust. 
And as soon as a president steps forward and does something of that nature, what happens? The lesser magistrate, in those cases, realizes they're not going to win this fight. And they step back, throw their hands up, and let the greater magistrate do what is righteous. Okay? Now, I'm trying to keep this short. But I just want to reiterate. It is not either or. Every level of government must protect and provide equal justice in order to follow both biblical mandates of what government, good government, righteous government is, as well as in our country, what the Constitution, which they all swear an oath to defend and protect when they are sworn into office. They have no choice. They must do this. And nine black robed oligarchs sitting in a room in the pandemic times right now by themselves because no one's allowed in the Supreme Court to give their talks at the moment. They are not God Almighty. They are not on high dictating to the rest of us. They are outside the bounds of biblical justice, the Constitution, their role in government. Quite literally, I, I really don't understand why, as a country, we are not advocating for the impeachment of all nine justices of the Supreme Court every day. And it's not just on this issue. This is just the most egregious, most evil example that we can use. But last I checked, the Supreme Court is not a lifetime license to do whatever you want. Period. It just isn't. And we need to start acting like it's not. So I would encourage you, regardless of what level of government you are looking at a politician who is running for office, if they are not willing to step forward and make these kinds of pronouncements and follow the Constitution at every level of government, they have not earned your vote, they do not deserve your vote, they are actively seeking to destroy our Constitution, and I don't care what label is behind their name. I really don't. Politicians and their consultants don't just look at how many votes they get and how many votes their opponents get. They also look at how many people didn't vote in a particular race. The difference between the number of voters in an election versus the number of votes cast in that particular race. And so, when we're looking at the presidential race, and people say, oh, there's only two choices, and you know for a fact there are more than that, what they're going to look at after the election is how many people voted in the election but did not vote for the choices that were immoral and following the unconstitutional current environment that we're in and promoting that. Every single person who casts a vote in that election as well as those who choose not to vote for the top two, but pick someone else to vote for, their voice is being heard loud and clear. I'm gonna wrap up with this. Four years ago in the state of Texas, 
at the presidential election of 2016, I used a spreadsheet and the Secretary of State's website to analyze the presidential election and how votes were distributed across the state of Texas. I was looking for a couple of things. I was looking to see, were they counting votes for men like Tom who were right in option? Were our elections officials doing their job and actually properly tallying all the votes? Because just like this election, in the state of Texas in 2016, there were four candidates whose names were on the ballot, and there were, in that election, over a dozen who were right in options. This year, there's nine of us, Tom, and eight others who are right in options. I'll be able to do the exact same analysis after this election. Out of 254 counties in the state of Texas, I found 29 counties with errors. Some of them were simple errors. Some of them were egregious errors. That's more than 10% of the counties in Texas that could not be bothered to vote or to count all the votes properly. I talked last night about abolitionists being involved in ballot access and in other aspects, right? Abolitionists also need to be involved in making sure that our elections offices are properly counting our votes and properly assessing who we are in support of. Because if we're not, as I asked last night, do we have representative government in this country anymore? I would argue we don't. When a county says that 13 writing candidates all received exactly one vote, it's not mathematically possible. It's just not. If I can identify that a county took the order of the candidates that the Secretary of State's department gave them and split them around so they'd now be alphabetical and gave candidate A, candidate B's votes, and candidate C, candidate D's votes, We're not being assessed for what we've actually voted for. And they say, well, you know what? You didn't win, so it doesn't really matter, right? No, it does matter. We do need to know who we're voting for. We need to know where they stand as a candidate, and we also need to know that our government knows that we voted for them, period. at every level of office. I picked on the presidency because it's a presidential election year. It's easy to keep track of these things and to double check and be a, an accountability check. But we have to pursue abolition at every level. It's not optional. Thank you for your time tonight.